As you'll notice, I finally remembered to bring my green screen through from the other room, and that means I can put whatever tasteful background I like behind this me. Is good news. And that also means we can do some giga brain stuff like this. So today, just gonna test out this format, see what you all think, a bit of top-down drawing. And we're gonna talk about the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, or the Monroe Kelly Hypothesis. It's one of the most important concepts in neurosurgery. I think something that could easily come up in medical school finals, uh, in your clinical vivas, or perhaps as part of an OSCE. It's a really core bit of physiology when it comes to the neurosciences that I think would be a very reasonable thing to test someone on. And the Monroe Kelly Doctrine is all about intracranial pressure. Here is the big idea, fundamentally. The skull is a rigid closed box and it's fused together. Not this one, it's got a hole in the top, but because it's fused, that means it can't expand to accommodate any change in volume, not at least without some significant discomfort. So most of the time, what sits inside this fixed box? Well, broadly, three things and they have to exist in some form of equilibrium to keep us alive. So we have intracranial volume, broadly consists of three things. That is the brain or the volume of the brain tissue, the parenchyma, and that makes up about 80% of what's inside the skull. You also have blood, both arterial and venous blood, that makes around 10 to 12%. And then the third main constituent as you will know, is cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, that makes up the final approximately 10%. Now, because the total volume inside the skull is fixed, as we just agreed, any increase in one of these three components must be offset by a decrease in one or both of the others. So if we suddenly get a large amount of CSF because we are hydrocephalic, because the intracranial volume is constant, that means if this one goes up, one of these two or both must go down in order to compensate, right? So now let's draw a graph, everyone's favorite thing to understand this visually. I'm gonna have a nice big graph and on the X axis going this way, we have intracranial volume and we'll remind ourselves that this is equal to those components so V brain, V blood plus V CSF. And then on the Y axis, going up this way, we have intracranial pressure, or ICP. Now we'll just give ourselves some reference points here, so going from 10 to 60. Now, under normal circumstances, ICP sits somewhere in between 5 and 15 millimeters of mercury in, in a normal person, so we'll give ourselves 10 as a reference point on the graph. So let's explore a clinical scenario and explore why we might have some problems. So if someone has a very large intracerebral hemorrhage, right? So they are bleeding into their skull. The volume of blood inside the skull is going up from this devastating bleed. So V blood is about to sharply increase. And so basically the volume inside the brain, inside the skull starts to increase and the pressure will start to slowly rise and rise. But here's the thing, right? The body has compensatory mechanisms. It can shift CSF, this component, down into the spinal canal. It can increase venous drainage from the brain to pull blood away. And the brain tissue itself is slightly elastic. It's jelly-like in its consistency. And that means it can deform a little bit, which is what we see here. So an increase in volume, even if it gets quite large, may only produce a small increase in pressure inside the head because of these compensatory mechanisms and the brain can take a little bit of squeezing. This is what we call compensation or the compensated phase, but there is a limit. And once these compensatory strategies are maxed out, then pressure starts to rise sharply and we get this. And this is when the patient starts to enter the decompensated phase. At this point, the brain can no longer absorb or manage the increase in pressure. Now, why is this dangerous? Why would we care? Well, there are two reasons. One is that this process affects cerebral perfusion pressure, CPP. And there is an equation that is very important. Cerebral perfusion pressure is the ability to supply our brain with oxygen. And there is an equation for calculating it. So we'll add it up here. Cerebral perfusion pressure equals the mean arterial pressure 
the pressure at which blood is being pumped around our systemic circulation minus ICP or intracranial pressure. What this means is that the higher the intracranial pressure becomes, the harder it is for blood to enter the skull and perfuse the brain because the body is trying to push harder and harder against an increasing pressure inside the brain. So as ICP rises, assuming there is no MAP or mean arterial pressure compensation, then cerebral perfusion pressure must fall. And if CPP drops too low, the brain does not get the oxygen it needs. And when the pressure starts to build, you will begin to get focal ischemia in the areas local to where this uh, pressure buildup is happening. But when that gets bad enough, you will begin to get global ischemia, hypoxic cellular injury to the entire brain. Cells start to die, you develop hypoxic brain injury. Your cells cannot get the oxygen that they need. Now I know that some of you watching will be shouting out, but there is compensation in mean arterial pressure. This is because the body can trigger what's called the Cushing reflex, which is this last ditch effort by the body to maintain brain perfusion. We'll talk about that in a future video. But the other major risk with all of this is herniation. And that is when rising pressure inside the skull forces parts of the brain to shift or displace. There are several types, but the classic one that you'll have heard of is tonsillar herniation. And that's when the cerebellar tonsils get pushed down through the foramen magnum, the big hole at the bottom of the skull. That is the area of least pressure inside your closed system. So naturally in a situation of high pressure, that is where the brain is gonna want to go. But that's an enormous problem because this compresses the brain stem that in turn affects respiration and heart rates because this is where the cardiac and respiratory centers are and it can lead to death through respiratory or cardiac arrest. This in the American medical dramas is what they mean when someone yells, he's coning. They're talking about tonsillar herniation. So to summarize, the skull is a fixed volume container. It contains brain, blood, and CSF. An increase in one must be offset by a decrease in the others. And if not, intracranial pressure must rise. When ICP goes up, CPP, cerebral perfusion pressure falls, and that leads to brain injury and in severe cases, herniation, global ischemia, and death. This doctrine underpins so much of what people do in neurosurgery, trauma, and intensive care, and if you can understand these basic physiological mechanisms, I think that puts you nicely ahead of the curve. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you liked this format. It was fun to try something different. It may work, it may not. Let me know what you think. Are there other topics that you'd like to see discussed this way? I think that things like renin angiotensin aldosterone, menstrual cycle, all of these things that are easy to understand through drawing and visual learning, there might be a, a way we can work on this together. So let me know. Thank you very much for watching. Take care and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.